Well, all right, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody. Another episode of Legends Sports and Amplify. And we are talking baseball history, Negro League history, black baseball history, Latin baseball, all those passions, pursuits that go into that. And to, today I'm really, really happy to have on He's the head of user experience for Sports Reference, a Sabre member, runs the Hall of Stats. Adam Dorowski, how are you, sir? Great. How are you doing, Philip? Good, Adam. Good, Adam. I appreciate you taking the time. This will be a lot of fun. I, I, I Before we got started here, I told you why I'm doing this, trying to provide the context and, and the backstory and get as many different viewpoints, particularly on black baseball history in the Negro Leagues. And, you know, you guys with sports reference, baseball reference have been in the middle of a lot of that recently, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us a little bit before we get started on some of those things, a little bit about you, how you, uh, I mean, everybody's got a, a, an origin story, a backstory too, uh, as far as baseball, you know, you get it in your blood, you, you get all that passion for it, sports in general even. And uh, I love hearing how people get to where they are in their journey. And here, here we are talking today. So tell us a little bit about, about your steps along the way. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, we can go way back. I, I was the kid that uh, maybe wasn't the uh, best player uh, at all. I, I looked like your, uh, your typical like veteran catcher uh, when I was 11 years old. I, I couldn't hit. You know, I like to be smart about the game, but, you know, definitely physical limitations. So that, that really uh, lended itself well to devouring the backs of baseball cards and baseball registers and reading about the history of the game. And that led me to like baseball simulators, like yeah. Earl Weaver baseball very early on for me. I know you're an out of the park guy. I oh, a, a... I played Stratomatic and Happa and I, uh, Earl Weaver status pro, you name it, whatever, whatever had a baseball game to it yeah extra innings oh, all yeah. kinds of different ones yeah yeah i guess a funny story about earl weaver baseball is i don't have like the typical oh i stumbled upon bill james origin story um i read a book like some guys that ran a earl weaver baseball league published a book and i found it for some reason because i loved the game and that talked about linear weights and, and position yeah. adjustments and stuff like that and i was like that was my mind-blowing experience so i got into stats it wasn't until like uh, 2006 that I started blogging about baseball history and, and this type of research. Um, 2008, I guess, is when I started the, the baseball twit account, which uh, uh, I started wow. tweeting at and doing some, some blogging around that. And 2010, I started writing for some sites like uh, uh, Beyond the Box Score and High Heat Stats. Cool. And all of that research I was doing there led me to uh, launching the, the Hall of Stats, which has kind of been my, my pet project uh, in baseball, which is an alternate Hall of Fame populated by yep. a mathematical formula. So it uses war and wins above replacement and some adjustments that uh, it adds to it to, to give every player in history a single number. And then it boots everybody out of the Hall of Fame and repopulates it just by that number. So it's a it's an interesting starting point for some of these discussions of, of who should be in the Hall of Fame. And shortly after that, I actually started uh, contracting for Sports Reference uh, as a design consultant. I had been working for other tech companies and stuff like that. <laughs> I guess early on, it never really occurred to me that a job in sports could be a reality. So mm -hmm. I was just kind of contracting for them for actually six years until I finally joined full-time cool. in, in uh, November of 2020. That is awesome. That is awesome. I mean, I, I hats off to you, man. I, I'm glad you got where you got to and whatever else you keep on going, just keep on going, keep at it. You know, that's, that's the, yeah. uh, the fun thing about it. And, you know, I, I mentioned to you briefly, um, as I started doing these to try to provide the context to the Negro leagues and just, just help, try to help tell the stories, whoever will, whoever will listen, I'll talk to, right. Uh, whoever will talk to me, I'll listen to, you yeah. know, <laughs> kind of thing. But the stories are important, and, and I think um, the stats are important. And, and you know, baseball reference, uh, sports reference in general, man, oh, man, there are people who, I mean, you, you know, you know. There are people who swear by those, by those numbers. Uh, I always tell my kids, I got three boys, and uh, one in the Navy, one in college, one who's five. <laughs> but, so they're all over the place. But, but you know, the world is math. Math, right. math drives everything. It doesn't matter what it is in some way, shape, or form, right? And baseball, probably of of all the sports, 
as crazy as it all is over the over the eras and and seasons it is baseball fans are statistical junkies right oh, absolutely <laughs> probably, yeah probably how you uh yeah i mean what, probably how you got into it right and eventually you get to this point because you're you're just like us and me and everybody else out there you you like those numbers right i stumbled upon baseball reference literally in in 2000 when it launched i remember being at work it was my first job out of college and i was like oh this is how i'm going to kill all of my time ever at work <laughs> going through baseball <laughs> reference for the next two decades but it absolutely is what it is but now you know that that's actually the job so i cool. i'm very much professionally living the dream i i, I definitely see that <laughs> and, and appreciate it Absolutely. Uh, when I had Gary uh, Gillette on, and he goes way back to the mm -hmm. early 80s, maybe even beyond that, I forget what years he told me, but he has been, uh, and he, you know, he got to grow with, as this, as this grew, um, with statistics and more analytics and more statistics and more analytics and bigger, bigger volumes of stats. And, and his story is just very similar to you. I mean, yours in a way i mean uh how he grew along with it and and it is evolving all the time and and as more stats come out and he's pointed that out several over the years that you, know, you go back and look at some of these players even ones that are in the hall of fame even and they find something yeah, they change this they change that back in the beginning there were there were different databases that had different numbers for different guys and trying to get that all coordinated um it's a lot of work right i mean do you do you do, do, you do any of the research itself or, or what what's your role over there at baseball at stats reference yeah i don't do like the research into digging into the old box scores to find out what actually was ty cobb's hit total or anything like that uh, i work closely with uh, designing new features or updating existing features and i talk to users all the time so people that use ah, yeah. baseball reference or any of our other sites i'm hopping on zoom calls much like this uh, just to chat with them and see what we should be doing with the sites and what their expectations are, what's working well, what's not. And uh, it's just a, a great way to talk to people about uh, sports. I mean, I'm really lucky that I am engaging with users and they are they get to talk about something that they truly love too. Like I'm not working on an app that they have to do for their taxes or something. This is like their labor of love that they're excited to talk to me about this. Right. So it's really a wonderful job. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, uh, we'll go out, we'll go out to your hall of stats. I'll throw that up uh, in, in, a, in a little bit. Cause I want people to see that uh, as well, but sports reference handles. I mean, I think most people I think are more familiar with the baseball side, but there's also basketball, NFL, hockey, college sports, uh, uh, soccer even right as well oh yes yeah you might be surprised there there are days that uh basketball and, and football are are outpacing baseball reference traffic wise there's obviously days where baseball reference uh, outdoes them all too uh we've they're all very popular and and uh, in particular, FB Ref is is our one that's growing. That's our newest site uh, on world soccer. Which, when I joined the company, I honestly baseball history I had gotten a little bit stale for me. I didn't have anything that was exciting me too much. So I really got into uh, international football, and and the launch of FB Ref really helped me with that. And nice. honestly, I I think. I think a lot of that that I took, like it's such an international game. Mm -hmm. There's people from all walks of life. I think that taking that back to my baseball research has really helped me build that interest in, in not only the Negro leagues, but you know, the, the Cuban leagues, the Puerto Rican leagues. This is all I've always known about uh this side of baseball the outsider baseball mm -hmm. but i i follow the game from like the stats first and then i use those stats to learn about everything else so mm -hmm. the fact that the stats were lagging behind for obvious reasons um it held me back and and i'm not proud of that i i wish i had been digging into these stories years and years and decades and decades ago mm -hmm. but i came late to the game but i i like to think that i'm making up for lost time with uh, diving in head first absolutely you know i i uh, think i mentioned to you but in 92 so so here i am a baseball fan much like you of course i'm older than you right so i'm back in the in the late 70s early 80s um 
and I'm playing Stratomatic, and I'm rolling dice, and Appa, and we're rolling dice, and the nuns are confiscating the cards off of us in the back of class, and you know all, all those all those stories that a lot of us crazy people who were doing that have done. And then you know I tried all kinds of other games, um, and I thought I knew baseball, and I knew baseball history. And because all these games, what these games tend to do, and, and you know well, or even with the st- stats on baseball reference, when you see something that's current, you want to go back and look at what happened before. And so you, you start going backwards. And that's kind of what I did with Stratomatic and some of these games. And then here I am, I get out of college, and I'm working for the Scranton Wilkes-Barre Red Barons in Northeast PA, the AAA team for the Phillies. Mm-hmm. And uh, much like you, it was like, wow, I'm getting paid to do this. I mean, this is awesome. I mean, I, during the games, I got to do the message board and the scoreboard in the outfield. And then, um, I did a little bit of marketing work and some other things. Right. And then, uh, 1992, Reggie Jackson has a benefit for the Negro league players association, which was just, just starting up. There was no, no pensions. None of these guys had anything really. And at the time, uh, you know, I got to meet double duty Radcliffe and Lester Lockett and Josh Gibson Jr. And many of these guys, Buck O'Neill, they were, they were there. I think there was 18, 20 players that were there. And I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, <laughs> when I heard these stories, they were there for the whole weekend. Um, and when I heard these stories, I was like, wow, I mean, I got to find out more about this. And so it's been ever since then. I mean, I, I don't think a day goes by that I don't do something that has to do with talking about it, looking mm-hmm. looking for something with the Negro Leagues. And so this has been a lot of fun because I got to actually talk to the people who were doing that work and the right. authors and researchers. And that was just like... Yeah, for them to give the time to do this and hopefully get people to see what they've been doing. It's because the story. Oh, I hear you. Those are the people that are inspiring yeah. me right now. Like I'm, Absolutely. I'm back in baseball re- uh, research mode. Like every day, like I'm done working on baseball reference for the entire day. So I'm like, okay, now it's time to do research. <laughs> That's just kind of the way my my days go. Obviously, you know, family so, and, and and dinners and stuff mixed in, but uh, so that, always yeah, learn about that stuff. It's fun, right? Mm-hmm. So we'll talk a little bit about some things in a bit, so the metrics and, and MLEs and things like that. But I want to ask you this because I think it's interesting. You mentioned about uh, international baseball and some other things a little, just a minute ago, right? So I, I follow like, I mean, they have baseball in Finland. Who knew? <laughs> you know, they have baseball in, in Romania. They have baseball in Poland. They have baseball everywhere, right? And they're playing a European tournament and they're playing... Obviously, we all, we all know about, you know, baseball in Korea, baseball in Japan. <clears throat> the, you know, most people probably know about baseball in the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Puerto Rico. But um, they do play it all over the world. I, I think people lose sight of that. I think everybody everybody in Europe or other places is a soccer soccer only country. Is is there ever? I mean, is Baseball Reference or any anybody do anything to try to get all of that into one umbrella? Because I noticed the one thing, the reason why I thought about that is because. I noticed that the football pages are in German uh, when I went to them. Is that uh, for for the soccer pages on on Sports Reference? So, has there ever been any talk to do something to get more than just U.S. baseball into that umbrella? Uh, that there's a million things that we would like to do. We would love to have any data from all over the world. Our basketball site actually has a ton of international data. uh, And obviously the the world football site does Mm -hmm. as well. Hockey has a little bit on, on individual player pages. um, But I would love to see over time, if we could get more of these data sets, like I have Borussia Dortmund jerseys behind me. I know that there's Uh a Dortmund Wanderers baseball team in, in Germany there, you know, they're a totally uh, amateur team, but it's it's funny that they're playing there too. The out of the park guys are German. That's right, Marcus. Yeah, yeah. Marcus Heinsohn and and uh, those guys that started that, and now of course they've been involved with other people who who were involved with it here, and that's how I started talking to them from version one. They're on version 20, 22 years. My goodness. But a quick sidebar about that actually, <laughs> in out of the park two. I started using that. I had a, a league with like 23 other people yeah. around the world. Let me see. Do I have it close by? I cool. have this book <laughs> to the point that we even put together. Oh, I don't have it here too. I must, but we even wrote our own articles and had our own blog site and our own podcast and, cool. and put out a physical anthology of like articles and Pretty books nice. for our 10th anniversary season. Like, I, I'm I'm right there with you with getting really into this type of stuff. Uh, you know, I, I've I've had some leagues I've been running with. There's 32 guys in a league that I've been running for um, 
uh, boy, I, I bet you it was 2010, I think it started. So 12 years it's been going. Uh, you meet a lot of cool people. You get to be lifelong friends. Uh, many of the guys that were in this league without the park were in, playing Stratomatic with me in the 80s and 90s. So oh, yeah. uh, lifelong friends I, I have made with some of these people. And it's it's been it's always been a lot of fun. And, and over time, I've met many of them, you know, personally uh, over time. You know, most of it's just, heck, before the internet, it was phone calls. Wow, how about that? You made a phone call and you, uh, you you wrote letters. We used to send statistics by regular U.S. post, <laughs> you know, put, stick it in an envelope and mail it. And that's how we compiled our stats. It was, cr you know, crazy days back in those days, you know. Yeah, we would take our baseball cards, pick players, punch all of those into Earl Weaver baseball, and then like have games played. And like my friend down the street would print out oh, all the fun. results with his dot matrix printer and hand them out on the bus. Mm -hmm. Like that's the type of stuff we were doing. The time. <laughs> There's guys doing that. The, they're still rolling the dice uh, that I follow a little bit. Uh, APA, uh, Stratomatic, that they're still rolling the dice and doing right in the box scores. And I still, I don't know if you can see it. I still have the writing callus from uh, <laughs> uh, probably a 10,000 box scores that I've <laughs> handwriting them for decades you know amazing anyway fun fun stuff but, but it's how you get into these passions and that's another reason why i'm trying to tell these stories and i've had other people on besides just the authors and researchers people who have done that type of work but then i started stepping on people who are doing art card art um acting music uh you know collecting the minor leagues uh latin baseball everybody's got you know something that clicks right when it comes to some of this stuff not just with baseball but you know the negro leagues and and it's just been uh really fun to try to get some of those people in front children's books because i think you know wh where's the next generation how do you get the next generation interested when i when i got interested in it, it was because my parents um my grand, my grandfather played a little bit, you know, semi-pro kind of leagues in, up in Pennsylvania. So, it, it it's from an early age, and you got to get that next generation um, interested in this. It's not can't just be us, you know. <laughs> Eventually, it's going to peter out, right? And that's kind of kind of sad. I mean, give me give me your opinion on this before we talk about some other stuff. The the baseball product today on the field to me is a little lacking. Maybe I have all the respect in the world for for professional athletes. Baseball, I think to me is the hardest sport, but the three true outcome thing is making my skin crawl. <laughs> the walk strikeout home run game. It's not the way baseball was intended. It's not the way it started. Uh, somehow we've gotten to where that's what is expected. Uh, and I, what, what, what's your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I I usually don't share my opinion on this okay, because I, I yeah. no no that's fine. But I usually it's because you know I this is the first thing that I probably feel like oh I'm just maybe old and haven't kept up with the times or something. That's what around. you get called but if you don't. If I you don't agree with right, that. and I'll, honestly, I I loved the you know '80s baseball and, and I just felt like. I don't know. I look back at those baseball cards and look at those players and I know I definitely feel nostalgic. So, I mean, it's probably similar to the thing where everybody's favorite music is the music from when they were like 15 to 20 or <laughs> maybe, whatever. Maybe. So that might be it. So that's why I try not to say my baseball yeah. was better, but I do feel internally that my baseball was better growing up. So um, you mentioned, and let's, let's, let's give people the, the, two cent tour on some of these metrics because you mentioned in your hall of stats uh war now to me you know i'm kind of war you know I, i'm i'm like the song what is it good for you know because there, there's not only is it kind of nebulous there's many wars right on top of that there's f wars and this war and that war so give us the the, the 10 cent tour of war and what is it good for i mean there, there's really two main wars there's the baseball reference and the fan graphs type and honestly for position players they're they're pretty darn similar the only difference is the defensive metric that they use so any variation is because of that now pitching war on the other hand it they could probably use different names because they're literally measuring different things baseball reference is based on the runs allowed and then, then there's adjustments made for the strength of competition, the strength of the defense, the park factors and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Whereas Fangraphs does a totally different thing. They are only looking at um, home runs, walks, and strikeouts, 
known as FIP or fielding independent pitching. So looking at just the things that the pitcher could control. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see things like Jim Cott having 45 baseball reference pitching war and 70 fan graphs pitching war. It doesn't happen very much. Mm -hmm. You can, you also get a pitcher like Rick Russell who has like 70 baseball reference war and using this totally different mathematical system has about 70 fan graphs war. So mm -hmm. in many cases they do agree, but there are some key differences. And on the pitching side, that's because they're measuring different things um, and using different theories of what makes a pitcher valuable essentially. So in terms of uh, what is it good for? It is good for an estimate of the value that a player brought. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very important to start there. Like I, I, maybe in my younger days, I felt like the hall of stats, you know, that that's the way the hall of fame should be. It should be mm -hmm. just by these numbers. And if you're not in the hall of stats, kick them out, replace them with these other guys. I've definitely changed my views since then. <laughs> I know that there are other things involved. There are things mm -hmm. that are not captured in the formulas. There are things that, uh, there are other reasons besides the stats that players deserve to be remembered. I mean, I very much feel like a very inclusive hall of fame is, is what we should have because I don't know that I don't understand the people who want to like, it's a, it should be a small hall. Only the very best should get in. Like, what's the fun in that? Like why only celebrate and remember a very small handful of players? Mm -hmm. Like I want to, I want to remember like so many of the great players from when I was younger and, and learn about the great players from other eras. Mm -hmm. So that's been my, my, uh, my theory on the hall of fame. So wins above replacement and wins above average. Uh, I don't know if you want me to explain the difference. Sure, so wins right. above average. Um, it is really just the, the number of wins that the player provided above the average player. Now, the, the reason that wins above replacement is much more common is because these days, a average player is not someone that's freely available. So you can't just say, oh, he was only two wins above average. We should just get another average, mm -hmm. or he wasn't even average. We should just get another average player. Mm -hmm. You can't just get another average player. Those are very valuable commodities that are making like, you know, $14 million a year or something like that. That's just a guess. I don't, it could be even more now. So wins above replacement tends, uh, it tries to take wins above average and adjust it down to what that freely available player would be. Like if a player is not even replacement level, yes, you can go and take a, uh, you know, the quad a slugger off of the, the triple a team and, and bring them up and expect to get that type of production. Mm -hmm. So wins Gosh. above average, I, I find that that measures a player's peak a little bit more, whereas wins above replacement, you compile uh, also for just kind of showing up and being better than a replacement level player year after year. So mm -hmm. a good explanation might be Omar Vizquel. You know, he's he was an above average player for 24 years, but wins above average only has him at like five wins above average for his entire career. Mm -hmm. And his wins above replacement is more like 45. Uh, now, Nomar Garcia Parra, his wins above replacement are something like 44, I think, but his wins above average is like 22. Mm -hmm. And like, how is that possible? Well, he had a much shorter career. So uh, Omar Vizquel, you know, he built up the value, but then he also had several years that he was below average at the end. And it kind of took away some of that value, whereas Nomar Garcia Parra built up all that value and then he was done. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really have that decline phase that that took it down. Cool. That's interesting. That's an interesting um, perspective. I think um, the um, the thing that I've seen, uh, if you can just run through this, MLEs have evolved over time, as most statistics and things have. So tell us tell us what an MLE is and why that's important. Yeah, I'm very new to the MLE game. Um, so what I will start with is. The, the number that the Hall of Stats uses is called Hall Rating. And that takes a combination of wins above replacement and wins above average. So we've got peak and longevity uh, included. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, we look at a whole player's career, that's the war. And then we give an extra bonus to that, that uh, those stats above average. And that gives a Hall Rating of, of a, a number that can be anywhere from negative to to almost 400. Babe Ruth has a, it's almost 400. Now the hall of fame borderline is 100. So anyone that has a hall rating of hundred 
is in. Mm -hmm. If it's below 100, it's out. So um, like a, a player like uh, Bobby Gritch, he's like in the 140 range and he's not in the Hall of Fame. But a player like, uh, I think Jim Rice is in like the, the 80 range or something like that. So he would be out. So that gives a, an example of, of how that works. Now the MLEs, uh, Eric Shalek, who you had on, he produces MLEs that uh, include wins above replacement and wins above average. So what I did was I just took his MLEs and pumped them into the, the hall rating system to find out what the Negro League players' hall ratings would be based on their MLEs. Now, the reason I didn't just use their their uh, their stats on baseball reference. Well, I do provide a, a hall rating based on those, but those stats, of course, are very different than the AL and NL stats of the time. The seasons were shorter. Mm -hmm. They played a lot of games that were not covered under those stats against uh, different competition. A lot of times these players played in different leagues because uh, there was more money or they played for independent teams because there was more money or they completely left the country sometimes. Mm -hmm. So what the MLEs that Eric uh, produces uh, does is it even takes those seasons and tries to provide a, a estimate of what these players would have done if they were in the AL slash NL system. So that's why I felt the better approach for the Hall of Stats rather than saying, like, I'll just pull up John Beckwith, for example. He's one of my favorites outside mm -hmm. of the Hall of Fame, absolute masher of a player. Mm -hmm. If you look at his Hall rating simply by um, his stats that are on baseball reference, of course, it's not going to load right now for me. <laughs> well, I think he would probably end up, you know, he's, he's not even at 100, and that that's, it's not a great, uh, mm -hmm. way to capture the impact that he had on the game. But if we use the MLEs that Eric Shalek created, he has a 167, which is, all right, now it finally came up. He has a 64 Hall rating just from his baseball reference stats because, you know, they're short seasons and incomplete data, but 167 based on the MLEs. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not just using that because it's higher. And I want to, you know, push the, the cases of, of Hall of Fame candidates for the Negro Leagues. I'm using it because it's a more accurate picture of what their career would have looked like if they were in the AL and NL system. I put a lot of thought into like, should I be using estimates for the Negro League players? Should I, I, I felt very strongly that the Negro League players needed to be on the Hall of Stats. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to I don't want to keep them separate again mm -hmm. because that's what was done to them the first time. Mm -hmm. But in this case, when I needed to build what their hall of fame case should look like, it wasn't fair to them to combine them with the other players. They really needed to have their own system. And I feel like this works much better than having someone look at, at Josh, uh, at John Beckwith's numbers and thinking he's not a hall of famer. So how do you, so, okay. That's a great summary. Uh, how how do you answer this? Um, so obviously, like we've you just talked about, I've talked about the Negro Leagues had their own, um, and Black Baseball had their own ecosystem, their own multiverse. They were playing um, league games sometimes. Sometimes they were playing uh, non-league games against league teams. Sometimes they were playing non-league games against uh, major league teams, mixes of teams, the firehouse team, so many different things. Then, like you mentioned, overseas, they go overseas, all that kind of thing, right? But now, technically, they are major leagues, right? They are major leagues just like the Union Association and the Federal League and and, and the others that are included in, in Major League Baseball. So how how does it square, right? When you think of this, right? Um, much of what I hear about the Negro Leagues is because they didn't play against Major League Baseball in league games, it's hard to, you know, get a gauge on, on how they would do, right? But until 1997, neither did Babe Ruth and the American League. They didn't play against the National League in regular season games ever. They played a handful of games, maybe four, maybe seven max. That was it. Right. So how, you know, nobody ever talks about, uh, do we need an MLE that says Babe Ruth should be this because he didn't play against the National League? And I've had that 
question asked me because technically it's true, right? I mean, they didn't play all those years. And on top of that, they didn't include Latin and, and uh, African-American players, uh, anybody with dark skin for all those years. So how do you, how do you square all that? that to, to me, um, they're all valid points because, yeah, the fact was Babe Ruth didn't play anybody in the National League until the World Series. So what, what do you, how do you square all of that for somebody? Yeah, that that's that's tough. There's <clears throat> there's a lot of different pieces to that. I mean, right? there are seasons decades ago where, and Scott Simkus, who you had on his book, even uh, points this out too, where the the strength of the AL and NL mm-hmm. were wildly different in yes. the same year, and there were plenty of years like that. And I think we even saw that too. There was uh, what a two decade span where the the NL absolutely dominated the All Star game. Mm-hmm. Mainly because they had a lot of they had a lot of players right. coming out of the Negro Leagues in Latin yeah, America. I was going right? to say, why is that? Yeah. Why would that be, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it it's tough. I mean, and I I get like I said, I get asked this. I I see these comments. I hear all these things, and and it's all it's all valid, right? So okay, the one the one guy who to me, um, I, I don't know. You look if you're looking at body of work, right? John Donaldson, mm-hmm. not in the Hall of Fame was up as part of that final, uh, you know, ballot just recently. Why would he not be uh, considered for the Hall of Fame? Because, I mean, when you look, he chose to barnstorm. He chose to not play. Whole teams chose to barnstorm. The Homestead Grays with, you know, Josh Gibson, they just dropped out of the Negro National League. They go barnstorm. Kenzie Monarchs did it. Um and and that was the case with John Donaldson for many, many years. He only played in the Negro National League a few seasons and off he went again. And there's many players like that. So, you know, to me, I, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, like I said, you, you, you can't go back. You know, what what this is what's been lost to baseball and why this argument will continue probably or this discussion will continue for a long, long time because you can't go back and unfortunately – ever see some of these things happen the way they may have played out. But so, so John Donaldson though, um, comes into the Negro national league. He's already 30. He's not even pitching much anymore. He's playing outfield just as much, um, plays a few seasons off. He goes again. So his body of work though, um, how how do you, I mean, to me, he's got a strong, as strong a case as anybody. If he had been given the opportunity, um, to maybe be in there. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I think he's a great way to describe my evolution on everything. He's been the most difficult candidate for me to, to get a grasp on. Yeah. And the reason is, you know, I started as soon as baseball reference, put this data up, I, I was all over it and his seasons in the Negro major leagues on baseball reference. Well, they're not impressive. His pitching. I mean, actually his first year, he did actually lead the league in, in FIP, but uh, his his record was six and six. He had a 3.78 ERA. And the next year he pitched in eight games and was done. He actually hung on a few years, like you mentioned, as a hitter and was an above average hitter, which I don't think people give John Donaldson enough credit for. Like mm-hmm. he was, <laughs> he was a great like, all around player. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, like, so I was like, you know, he's he's he just doesn't have the numbers. You know, this was supposed to be his prime, like 29 to 33. And it just isn't there. But the more I learned about him, the more I realized it was the seasons before that Mm -hmm. where he was barnstorming and he was making his money doing what he needed to do because he didn't even have Negro major leagues yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Rube Foster hadn't uh, organized the the Negro National League. So he's going around the country, getting the money that he can pitching every day. And by the time he makes it to, to the Monarchs in 1920, that arm is burnt out. Mm-hmm. That arm has done a lot of pitching. So the MLEs, I, I didn't know exactly what to, to make of them at first because his, his uh, hall rating actually comes out to 50 out of 100. So the reason why is because there are only a few seasons that are included. Mm -hmm. Those seasons are very good in the MLEs, but it just doesn't last long. And Mm -hmm. because they were against weaker competition, Mm -hmm. it does downgrade the numbers some more. Mm -hmm. So it took me to kind of shift my thinking and say, well, he doesn't have to be in as a player. Like John Donaldson could be the pioneer of the barnstorming. And he was, 
he was one of the ones that paved the way for, you know, the things that Satchel Page came and did later and so many other players came and did later. Mm -hmm. So he had a very brief career that, you know, you know, burned very brightly. And then it, it looks like what happened is his arm just gave out under all of that strain. Mm -hmm. But the things he did were, I mean, we have all of these documented wins and strikeouts, but yes, they were against lesser competition. So wow. that's very hard to translate. So before we, right when we first got started, I know uh, we talked about this, but um, many of the authors and researchers I've talked to, you know them well, you've talked to some of them yourself. They all had a hand in coming up with the, uh, the document that just went out, right? Recently, the, the Sabre members got the, uh, the uh, Negro Leagues are major leagues and all yes. that background. And it's some great, it's, I mean, it's incredible. It gives a lot of great context. Um, the stories of these guys are are really, uh, really important. And, and you know, that was, and I'm not sure, you know, if you were involved in that process with, with baseball reference, but didn't they take a look at some of that as well? Not just the numbers when they came to their decision to, to go ahead and add the uh, statistics. Yeah, that project, I mean, first of all, it was the most fulfilling project I've ever been a part of in my professional career. It was just unbelievable. So it all started um, a few months before I joined full-time. Uh, ben Lindbergh wrote his piece in The Ringer, essentially asking the question, like, why aren't the Negro Leagues major leagues? Yeah. So that's what got the ball rolling for us. And we started, you know, looking into how we could do this. Um, then Major League Baseball did make the announcement in December that... Um, the Negro leagues were going to be classified as, as major league and that they would be added to, added to the statistical record, which I'm still not exactly sure what that means. The, there aren't any Negro league stats like on the official MLB.com gotcha. stats site, mm -hmm. but um, you know, a lot of people look at baseball reference as the de facto record. Mm -hmm. And luckily we already had this uh, underway and we continued working on it. It took months and months because we had to redefine what 20 years of assumptions of what a major league was mm -hmm. uh, in our database. Not only that, but we didn't feel like we could release this just, you can't just put it out there and be like, oh, Josh Gibson only had 165 home runs. Uh, have a nice day. We, uh, so that's why we commissioned all of these articles that, uh, provided this context about what, mm -hmm. what the Negro leagues were, how they operated, how they were different, how Josh Gibson probably did have, you know, almost 900 home runs or whatever it was mm -hmm. on the hall of fame plaque, but they just weren't in the league games. Mm -hmm. And on baseball reference, we're showing the league games, mm -hmm. but you have to understand that the Negro leagues, they didn't have the money that the major, the other major leagues did. So mm -hmm. they needed to do the barnstorming to, to bring in those paychecks as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, none of that stuff is their fault. Mm -hmm. Like they were forced to do that because they were excluded from the system. Mm -hmm. So we needed to, to find a way to, to express that. And we did that through our landing page, which had a, a beautiful mm -hmm. description that we had. And then the links to all of the articles, which uh, I had the pleasure of uh, editing a lot of those and, and Great working with the, with the authors there. And that's where I started learning so much. Mm -hmm. um, and that just got my, my wheels haven't stopped since mm -hmm. I started receiving those. And it's, it was such incredible work that we worked with Sabre to, to put it into a book form. And actually I just arrived the other day. I've yeah, got it sitting right it here. All right. And uh, yeah. Awesome. So you can get that now from really anywhere books are sold, I think. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, Sabre members can get it from the Sabre store for half price or download the ebook for free. So that's awesome. that's definitely a, a nice thing for, for Sabre uh, Absolutely. folks. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, like you just said, I mean, and then on top of that, the the people who had the keys to the kingdom, um, Kenneth Salmon and Landis as commissioner, um, you know, pretty much openly said it. Uh, no, nope, integration is not going to happen on my watch, uh, and and did many things to make sure. And now his name is no longer on the MVP award. Um, you know, JG Taylor Spink with the Sporting News. Um, you know, that was the baseball reference, the Bible of sports and baseball for decades and decades and decades. And, and you know, back in that t same time frame, um, you know, they kind of went out of their way to not say anything. And when they did, maybe it wasn't all that, you know, 
positive some of the things that they were saying, even when Jackie Robinson integrated. Um, some of the things I've read from those days back in the late 40s, early 50s, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you wonder what reality that, that some of these articles were written under, you know, and, and we know what that was. But And his name is no longer on the, on the Baseball Writers uh, Association Award. So, you know, hindsight, uh, you know, they always say hindsight, yeah, you know, hindsight, anybody, you know, hindsight's 2020, right? But in some cases, you have to kind of go back and correct the record. And it's just, I'm just glad that at, at Baseball Reference, Major League Baseball, they, they, they did these things. Because it, it really, it's, it's opened up a whole nother, um, you know, I think a great opportunity for people to learn about a lot of things that they maybe didn't know about before because nobody's really talking about it, you know. Um, I'm very proud to work for a company like Sports Reference that has yeah. the, these values because I get it's the messages cool. too from people that say, you know, I don't think that the Negro League stats should be, you know, mixed into stat head. They're getting in the way. No, I, I get people saying, you know, I don't want to have WNBA content in my NBA newsletter, you know, make that a separate thing. No, these are, these are things that we have taken a stance as a company that awesome. they, these underserved communities, uh, whether it's, you know, black baseball or women's sports, uh, mm -hmm. these are very important to us and we want to have a part in helping them grow. So. Awesome. Uh, you know, the other thing I, I try to point out on all these things and I, and I, for, for this lockout and we're on day, what, like 50 now ish, I don't know, we're somewhere wow. there, 49, something like that. But the, um, uh, I, I started doing a little project with Out of the Park where I was just tracking through baseball history, starting in 1871, telling the stories about, you know, the teams letting the game do all the handling. But I integrated it from the beginning so you could see these guys playing, mm -hmm. right? It's been kind of fun to see these numbers as they populate in there and how many wins Smokey Joe Williams gets pitching for the Brooklyn Dodgers. It was very, very cool. But I, and I'm in 1925 now. Um, so I've been doing a couple of seasons every day. Uh, but... Um, one of the things I try to point out, too, is how the game has changed. And when people started saying to me, why are we putting these Negro League stats in there? Well, wait a minute. You're okay with Tim Keefe, who was pitching underhand back in 1880, having the lowest DRA. That was fine, but don't let those black guys, no, don't let them have their stats in there. The game has changed so much from the beginning and I try to track through all these rule changes and mound just you know the people today freaking out about you know they, they experimented with moving the mound back six inches in like rookie league or pioneer league or something they moved it back five and a half feet in 1894 <laughs> I mean five and a half feet exactly. they moved it back because Amos Rusi was almost killing people uh, so they, they had to do something about it. This is the way the game evolves and changes. And there's always that little push and shove between who's, you know, trying to get one up on the other, whether it's offense, defense or whatever. I'll tell you what, one way, one way they can get the game back to uh, a little bit more. I don't want to say normal because it's never been normal, but you, you know what I'm saying? One way to get the, to get that back is let, let's cut the roster size down to like 17 or 15, like it used to be back in and this way. You're not running a pitcher out there. That's throwing 102 every pitch <laughs> for the whole nine exactly. innings, you know, yeah. because it was a different game, right? I mean, you, you, you know how the game has tracked and why were pitchers only throwing um, in the eighties or nineties. Cause you know what? They can't throw a hundred every day <laughs> and throw 120 pitches every day. It's, it's just basically impossible. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's been a lot of things that, uh, um, you know, have, has, change the game yeah these guys are in great shape today but boy oh boy they were in pretty good shape years ago too but it was apples and oranges the way the game uh, is played so anyway uh, the other the other thing i find interesting about baseball history is with the negro leagues how many high level figures whether they be hall of fame players ted williams with his famous speech about the hall of fame but um you know, John McGraw, always talking about how good these Negro League players were. You know, it's kind of like where there's smoke, there's fire, you know. They, they, mm -hmm. they had, they're, they're not gaining anything by saying these things. Um, so that should have, I mean, did they take into account any of that with baseball reference as far as those? Is that all part of that documentation? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the way their contemporaries viewed these guys over the years. Um, I'm sure. I, I forget exactly if, if the way like John, you know, it's, it's tough with John McGraw because he had, you know, he supposedly had his list of, of players that he would, he would certainly bring on if, if he was allowed to, but at the same time, he also has 
questionable racist past too. So I, I, I have a hard time figuring out <laughs> who to who to like essentially from that era of white baseball. It's it's tough uh, finding you know allies through through all of this. Uh, I, I assume that some of the articles did refer to some of the the contemporary uh, thoughts. I, I forget exactly if if they did though, because it, it's important. I mean, these guys had no reason to be saying. I mean, that's that's what really got the ball rolling on a lot of the Negro League uh, research and and back in the seventies was Ted Williams's speech. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and Todd Peterson's uh, article that he put up for it has all all of the the individual results from Negro league teams playing against major league teams and, and things like that. So there's, there's certainly those statistical accounts of, of how they stacked up as well. So let's, let's go on out to the, uh, the hall of stats here. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pull up your um, web page and let people see that one second. Uh because I think it's it's definitely something that um, baseball fans of all of all ages and and interests could probably appreciate, you know. So we are here at the Hall of Stats dot com. Uh, I started on the Negro League page. Let me go to the um, to your uh, main page. And you know, like I said, I've had this. I've been asked this question so many times too um, about. Well, is it the Hall of Fame or is it the Hall of Stats? And and yes, there are many guys in the Hall of Fame where you got to scratch your head and go, hmm, yeah, you know, why is Freddie Lidstrom and Rabbit Moranville and <laughs> Burley Grimes and some of these guys, how'd they get in there? And many of them, you know, we just talked about John McGraw. Many of them have a tie to John McGraw. And and if you were tied with John McGraw or uh, who else was in there? Freddie, Frankie Frisch got a lot Thank of guys you, in there. Yeah, they had a lot of pull and they had a lot of their boys got, uh, got put in there if you had ties to those teams. But so... So walk us through what we're seeing here on the uh, Hall of Stats. I'm on the um, I'm on the main page. You've got um, similarity scores, the formula. Uh, how many people you got working with you on this? Uh, it, it's really just me now. I do have a couple of friends that uh, are developers okay. I've worked with over the years that help me out if I'm trying to add something and, and can't quite do it myself. But for the most part, I'm working on it myself. They they played a huge part with helping uh, set it up at the beginning. That's Jeffrey Chupp and, and Michael Berkowitz. They, they built a lot of the early features, but also built it in a way that I can add things pretty easily now, which is nice. Cool, cool. And you've got a whole entire section donated to the Negro leagues on here, right? Let me go back here. Yeah. At the, at the very top of the page, if you click on MLEs, that's where the, okay. the Negro league MLEs I I, are. I knew I saw it somewhere. And how often are you updating this? Um, well, it just updated for the first time right around the new year, but I also, that was uh, with like 114 players and, uh, Eric Shalek provided a bunch more MLEs, and now there's over 400 Negro League players on there now. Some of them are not even, they weren't even on the site before because they never appeared in the quote unquote <laughs> major leagues. You know, that so, would be. Um, I see you got Joe, Smokey Joe Williams listed number one. And yeah, it's score- interesting to see him above Satchel Page, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, but you know, what's interesting about it is I'm looking at the career years you got here for him, 1923 to 32. I mean, he was pitching back more like starting like 1905. <laughs> right. Yeah. You that's know, one of those his things. His career goes the, uh... way back there. Imagine what, what would his number be if he was able to have pitched in organized, uh, you know. Yeah. The 23 to 32 fashion. is actually his years that he was in the Negro major mm-hmm. leagues. Mm-hmm. So his, I, I've wondered if maybe on this page, I should actually replace it with the years that their uh, MLEs gotcha. come from, gotcha, gotcha. which uh, let me see what years those would be. His years that his MLEs come from are 1907 yeah, to 1930. Go. Yeah, so. there you go. I knew, I knew, yeah, he was much earlier than that because he was pitching for some of the great, great, um, you know, early teams of the aughts and teens well before he got to the Negro National League. Yeah, Pop Lloyd kind of the same way, right? 1921, but he was more closer to 1900 than 1921, right? right? Boy, oh boy. Yeah, that's what makes this so hard. Boy, His MLE is starting in 06. Pop Lloyd's? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I get it. I mean, boy, oh boy, it, it like I said, it, it's a multiverse. I mean, I, I my 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 little guy loves that Spider Man cartoon that's got all the different Spider Man that come from all over the different universes, and that's kind of what. And, and it was it was it's actually Stephen Greenis that used that term. I kind of like it. That's what the Negro Leagues were. They had different different Spider Men for different depending on what type of game they were playing. And imagine, right? I mean, playing two and three games on some days on the weekend and traveling in between, and then they had to get out of town by sundown because of uh, whatever circumstances they were dealing with. You know, the white players may have done some barnstorming, but nobody mm-hmm. had to live under those conditions um, on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, I, ah, boy, every time I hear somebody say something, and I, I'm 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 good. I, I like I like to hear a healthy discussion, but let's let's see today if people could handle what some of these guys had to deal with back in 1920, 1930. You know. Yeah, and, I think it's worth noting too that these MLE numbers that you're looking at, mm-hmm. they are um, conservative. I think, like yeah, you I look at Josh sure. Gibson at 170, like. Mm-hmm. I would think Josh Gibson would be much higher than that. So like even Oscar Charleston at 200, that would put him at uh, 31st all time. And we know that Oscar Charleston was better than one of the top 30 players all time. He was probably a top five, if Mm not, you know, top 10, top five, if not higher. So I think that that's a good thing to remember that a lot of these numbers are coming in pretty conservatively, to be honest. And you know what though? I mean, um, hats off to all you guys doing this stuff i mean you're making people people if you make the effort you start the conversation and i think all you guys like you've even already pointed out a couple of times i put you back on is um you your viewpoint and your um way of seeing things and maybe your way of calculating and that kind of thing it evolves over time right i mean it, mm-hmm. it's not it, it nothing is set in stone um you know you, you you're we're all learning a lot of us are learning this uh, certainly about negro league baseball history kind of together and it's kind of fun right i mean it really yeah it really is kind of fun um what do you what's uh, what are you working on next what, what's going on in your world oh gosh um in terms of, you know, there's there's a lot of learning um, and a lot of uh, podcast episodes that are coming from that learning. Actually, mm-hmm. I would love to to get uh, Gary Ashwell on to chat about some of these Latin mm-hmm. players because, you know, I was going through, you know, it was, boy, oh boy. you know, you see some of these uh, MLEs, you see people outside of the Hall of Fame like John Beckwith at 167 or Heavy Johnson at 146. But then uh, I'll admit when I got to uh, Julian Castillo at <laughs> at 102 above the Hall of Fame line. I was like, "Wait, who?" <laughs> I, so I, I could. <laughs> he is the single season batting average record holder. I'm scrolling down your list here, trying to find Tetelo Vargas, and I'm not even seeing him. <laughs> yeah, Vargas is down listed. at 70. Actually, is he okay? Yeah, which yeah, I, I feel like that's probably a little uh, conservative on on him. Uh, I don't even see him there. I see uh, Webster McDonald is listed seventy there, but let me see. Oh, uh, he, his hall rating is seventy, oh, so gotcha. he's just a few slots 75. below. Seventy-five. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Now I see him. Uh, and so there, there's, I mean, those types of guys are great examples, especially um, the players who, you know, like a Wild Bill Wright, who uh, mm. pretty much exits U.S. baseball and stays in Mexico. Uh, but if he had stayed, um, would have been a f- phenomenal player. Um, you know, had he, in, in, in the years he did play, were uh, notable. There's many like that. I mean, you know, I, I put out something today about... Um, a player that, you know, as I'm poking through, I have a database of probably 200,000 guys that some of it's from um, the out of the park stuff. Some of it's stuff that I've compiled and add in there over the years. You know how that goes. Right. And when I, um, I dig through to find something for the day, I'm trying to track along with where I'm at in that little simulation. And I came across um, Enrique Lantigua. 
And I'm like, who's this guy, right? I mean, just for the heck of it. And I look, he played one season, like a handful of games for the New York Cubans in 1935. And then I go look at his story and it's like, oh my God, you can make a movie out of this guy's life. I know, I saw I that. Mean, it's was... like, are you kidding me? Okay. <laughs> I mean, you, you literally could make a movie out of that guy's life and no one's ever heard of him. And he played about five games in the Negro Leagues, um, but was a notable player and boy oh boy that's something i guess you just can never put your finger on because many of these guys choose to they don't everybody wants to come here now right i mean Mm -hmm. there's 200 camps down in the dominican and and they're signing these kids at 12 years old to three million dollar signing bonuses at 12 years old now you know um they um was not the case back in in these days we're talking about the 20s 30s if maybe before that because of what they had to deal with and so you know you wonder how much baseball and and baseball fans missed out on on a player like him not I'm not saying he would have been a star and that's the thing too right no one is saying every single ma- negro league baseball black baseball player would have been replacing all of them no no you know there's going to be a chunk of a percent of them 20 to 40 percent probably that would have made the majors replacing the Mm -hmm. 20 to 40 percent that would have been taken out of major league baseball and off you go and how they do some of those guys are going to be cups of coffee some of them are going to be the smoky joe williams's and the satchel pages and that's the way baseball in history is um but they never got that opportunity and it's a shame so right uh, yeah the negro major leagues span from 1920 to 1948 that's 29 years I did a stat head search for the 29 years after that to see uh, what the top 40 position players were by wins above replacement. Mm -hmm. And out of the 40, 21 of them would not have been allowed to play in the Mm -hmm. previous 29 years. So that made me think, Hmm. all right, we're not talking like, Oh, who should the next five Negro league players be in the hall of fame? You know, it's probably dozens. I don't know how many dozens, but we're probably talking dozens here. So that's why uh, my podcast started as a way to identify uh, players for the early baseball era and golden days ballots. It's called building the ballot. Mm -hmm. So that's what it started with. And it's just kind of taken this pivot uh, towards Negro league research because I just found that that's that's the gold mine of, of candidates is in, in black baseball and the Negro leagues. Unfortunately, a lot of this, um, it's going to hit a wall sooner or later because there's only so much that can be uncovered. Um, you know, hopefully then maybe there's a, maybe there's an old warehouse somewhere full of box scores from 1932 or 1898 or what pick a year. Right. But maybe not. Right. I mean, I talked to, when I talked to Leslie, um, she told the story about, she was doing some research, called somebody up who was running a newspaper somewhere and the, the fella had passed away. The wife had, she said, boy, if you had just called a few weeks ago, I had all this stuff in a warehouse. I only kept some of the stuff. And so she kept some of it. And it was like, you know, uh, payroll registers and some letters and some things that they had. Some some very, very cool historical uh, documents and artifacts. Mm-hmm. But who knows what was in the half a warehouse full of papers that got just into the dumpster right. <laughs> and that's kind of unfortunate i i think we're gonna hit you're gonna hit a wall i think at some point on some of this with with baseball history uh with the negro leagues and, it's, and that's why i think the stories still need to be uh told and they're important and and you guys doing what you're doing and like i said that that's awesome that baseball reference has that viewpoint of uh, yeah this is the this is who we are and who should be included and if you don't like it well you know um, I, I guess, right. Um, this, that, that was major league baseball. We are showing you major league baseball to the best of our ability. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, so the, the projects with, are you going to keep up with this hall? How, how often do you do these hall of stats inductions and those types of things? Well, the hall of stats grows along with the hall of fame. So every time there's an induction, so the, the way that it works is uh, like if David Ortiz does happen to be the only inductee, what happens is uh, then the Hall of Stats grows by one, by one member. It wouldn't actually be David Ortiz because he's actually a little bit below the line. Mm-hmm. It would end up being Alex Rodriguez because he's the only player 
the only new candidate to this ballot uh, who would mm-hmm. be going in. So it would, it would it would even out in that respect. But yeah, there's a, a lot of players on this on this ballot that are in the Hall of Stats, like the returning candidates that are in the. Uh, let me see if I can pull that up quick. Just the returning candidates uh, on the BBWA ballot that are on uh, that are already in the Hall of Stats. It's Bonds, Clemens, Schilling, Roland, Manny Ramirez, Under Jones, Todd Hilton, uh, Sammy mm-hmm. Sosa, Gary Sheffield, Bobby Abreu, Andy Pettit, Tim Hudson, uh, Tim Hudson, uh, wow. Mark Burley, Hudson. Jeff Kent, all in there. The only two re- that were returning that are not actually, not actually over the line are Omar Vizquel and Billy Wagner, though I admit the Hall of Stats does not handle relief pitching well. Either relief pitchers are not valuable or we're not doing it right. It's one of those two things. Mm-hmm. I think they're pretty valuable. <laughs> I always, all my, all my, uh, doesn't matter what league I'm playing in for as long as I've been playing, I've always like, you got to have that closer. You got to have somebody to come shut the door, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And you're right. Maybe there, there's not a, not an easy way to put a value on that, um, historically, but, uh, uh, who would you rather have on the mound at the end of a game, Mariano Rivera or Billy Wagner or, Jonathan Papelbon, somebody like that in, in when mm-hmm. they were closing out games or somebody else, you know, <laughs> and mm-hmm. they're not that easily replaceable, but you're right. Even the hall of fame does not handle um, relievers, closers, especially all that well, but yeah, it's tough to be consistent. Like mm-hmm. why is Dan Quisenberry not a hall of famer? If, mm-hmm. if these other guys are, yeah, that Bruce type Suter. Of thing. yeah, you know, some of these guys are, why not? I mean, should be, should be. I mean, the thing with like Pettit, Hudson and Burley, is their hall ratings are like in the 108, 106 range. So they're over the line, but they're not above the median hall of famer. Gotcha. So it's not like their induction would improve the overall quality of the hall of fame. Mm-hmm. They just meet the established uh, yeah. standard, yeah. which yeah. is fine. And that's fine. Like Helton Jones, uh, Ramirez, Roland Schilling, Clemens and Bonds are all over that median so they would drastically improve the uh no, it's fun. fun stuff i i think i think this kind of stuff is uh uh it's important because it gives a lot of perspective people need to see um different angles what's pure statistics what's subjective what's not and with the negro leagues you got to take all of that and kind of you know wrap your head around a lot of things and then layer more stuff on top of that with you know these other issues that we've talked about with the uh, climate the racial uh you know aspects that they had to deal with the, the jim crow everything else and and you you really um like, like i said the work that baseball reference put out to give that context is just fantastic i hope people more people check it out but I, I appreciate you. you taking time. This this was a lot of fun. I, like I said, I wanted to get somebody on who could speak from Baseball Reference for a long, long time uh, as to the reasons and the inner workings because it 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 set things going in the right direction and it was important. And there's a lot of ongoing work, so keep it up, man. Absolutely, yeah. Keep it up, man. Hats off to you, and um, you take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Lucky to work for a great team that was uh, that did a great job on this project. So Absolutely. thank you very much for having me and discussing this. It's always fun. All right, man. Don't sign off. I'm going to sh- get us off to live. Thank you. Take care.